Good afternoon, friends. I'm Ed Steinfeld, Director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. And uh, I'm delighted today that we're doing this event on rising tensions in the Taiwan Straits. Will the Chinese Civil War end with a bang or a whimper? This is obviously a, an extremely important topic. It's a particularly important topic today, given changing force structures in the region, changing cap military capabilities in the region and beyond, changing rhetoric, particularly between the United States and China, and also, a, I would argue, a shifting discourse um, within both China and the United States about Taiwan and the Taiwan Straits. We have two truly phenomenal speakers today to discuss this issue with us all and to educate us. Let me do some very brief introductions, although I think both speakers are very familiar to you, and then I'll turn it over to the speakers. Um, first, on my left, we have Chaz Freeman. Chaz, as many of you know, has been a senior fellow and a visiting scholar here at the Watson Institute. He's former Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. He had served previously also as ambassador to Saudi Arabia, principal deputy assistant secretary of state for African affairs and charge d'affaires at, at the American embassy in Bangkok, Bangkok and Beijing. Chaz, as many of you know, was the principal American interpreter during President Nixon's historical and pathbreaking uh, opening to China, opening visit in 1972. Farther to my left is Lyle Goldstein, who is director of Asia engagement at Defense Priorities. And um, I think it's fair to say will soon be joining us at the Watson Institute as a visiting scholar. Uh, Lyle, as many of you know, he is a well-known scholar. He formerly served for 20 years as a research professor at the US Naval War College um, in that post. He led for a number of years the China Maritime Studies Institute. Uh, Lyle focuses on maritime security and nuclear security issues, as well as US-China relations, generally China-Russia relations, US-Russia relations. Uh, Lyle is the author of numerous books. He speaks both Russian and Chinese. Um, and uh, of the many books that he's written that have deeply influenced me is Meeting China Halfway, which came out in 2015. Right. So with that, let me turn it over to Chaz and Lyle. They'll speak for roughly 45 minutes or so, and then we'll just open it up to questions. And I'll remind you also that there is a, an online audience as well. So we're likely going to pass around a microphone for you to use when you ask questions so that the online audience can hear it as well. Thank you. Chaz. Thank you, Ed. Um, it's a pleasure to be back physically at Watson. And I had to take the speaker's prerogative to unmask myself for the period of the talk. Um, um, American and Chinese views of the Taiwan issue, the question of what political relationship the island should have with the Chinese mainland uh, could now hardly be more different. The issue is the legacy of the unfinished Chinese civil war, US containment policies, and divergent political evolutions. It's become very hard to see a path to its peaceful revolution, evolution, uh, sorry, resolution, but anything else would be a tragedy with incalculable collateral damage up to and including a possible nuclear exchange between China and the United States. For most Americans, Taiwan has no past. It's a democratic country that for some inexplicable reason, the Chinese Communist Party wants to swallow. We Americans are famously amnesiac. We've forgotten how differently we portrayed Taiwan in the 1950s and 60s. Back then, we asserted that despite its defeat on the mainland, the Chinese regime that had retreated to Taiwan was still the lawful government of all of China, including the mainland and outer Mongolia, as well as Taiwan. And we insisted on the right of the defeated Chinese authorities in Taipei to continue to represent China internationally. On several occasions during the Korean conflict and later as air battles took place in the Taiwan Strait, we threatened to attack the China mainland with nuclear weapons. That's why they developed their nuclear program. We helped defend the so-called offshore islands that Taipei still controls in the mainland Chinese provinces of Zhejiang and Fujian. Taipei and Beijing saw Taipei's retention of these as symbolizing both their ongoing civil war and their shared assertion 
that there was only one China and that Taiwan was part of it. In 1972, we began to set aside deference to Taipei's claim that it, rather than Beijing, was China's capital and to join Beijing in a united front against Moscow. This transformed global geopolitics and ultimately helped bring down the USSR, ending the Cold War. But as the, China, as the Taiwan question receded from American minds, neither Taiwan, its inclusion in the US sphere of influence, nor Chinese nationalism on the mainland faded away. As time went on under continuing American protection, Taiwan democratized. Many of its people asserted an identity distinct from that of other Chinese, and the ruling authorities in Taipei decided they no longer aspired to rule all of China. They then sought unilaterally to call off the Chinese Civil War, but no war ends until both sides agree it's over. Ending the foreign-sponsored division of China has been the passionate imperative of Chinese patriots for more than a century. It still is. For Chinese nationalists, US support for Taiwan's continuing separation from the rest of China is a perpetuation of foreign imperialist efforts to carve their country into spheres of influence, disre disrespect the right of Chinese to determine their own destiny, deny the legitimacy of their government, and prop up a rival to that government in, on Taiwan. In the 1970s, Washington agreed with Beijing on a formula for managing the Taiwan question that left the Chinese Civil War to be worked out between Beijing and Taipei. It has not been worked out. Many now speculate that this long quiescent struggle could be about to re-erupt into military confrontation, this time in a war between China and the United States, as well as between the unreconciled Chinese parties on either side of the Taiwan Strait. Beijing has repeatedly emphasized its strong preference for accomplishing national reunification peacefully rather than with the use of force. Xi Jinping did that on Monday again with uh, President Biden. It has offered to accept what amounts to a symbolic rather than substantive form of reunification with Taiwan. But to win without fighting, Beijing must show that even if the US backs Taiwan, its people, People's Liberation Army, or PLA, would surely win if the two sides to were to return to combat. And that Taipei therefore has no realistic alternative to the negotiation of some form of reconciliation with Chinese across the strait. The PLA's current shows of force are aimed at bringing Taipei back to the negotiating table, which the island abandoned when it elected leaders committing, who committed themselves to seek an identity separate from China. So far, Beijing's shows of force have not changed Taipei's refusal to talk about peaceful reunification. No talks mean no path to peace. In 1979, Beijing normalized relations with Washington. Without giving up its right to use force against Taiwan, it adopted a strategy of peaceful reunification premised on formal undertakings from the United States to sever official relations with Taipei, withdraw US military forces and installations from Taiwan, and annul its previous defense commitment to the island even as it continued to sell weapons to Taipei. In the 1980s, US compliance with these conditions, memorialized in three joint communiques, incentivized Beijing to pursue a peaceful settlement with Taipei, even as it encouraged Taipei to seek a modus vivendi with Beijing. But from Beijing's perspective, incremental changes in US policies toward Taiwan since then have culminated in a de facto invalidation of the premises on which the two sides originally finessed the issue. Washington has openly restored high-level official interactions with the authorities in Taipei, resumed opposition to 
third countries, switching diplomatic relations from Taipei to Beijing, reestablished an overt military presence and possible tripwire on the island, and escalated its threats to intervene should war between Beijing and Taipei resume. In these circumstances, Sino-American relations have become not just distrustful, but hostile. And behind its increasingly overt American shield, Taipei has become progressively less risk averse and more insistent on a status as a state independent from the rest of China. Washington's lip service to the three communiques is now so thoroughly contradicted by US behavior that it is no longer persuasive. As Foreign Minister Wang Yi, speaking for China in unprecedentedly uh, accusatory terms, put it in his most recent meeting with Secretary of State uh, Blinken, we, meaning China, require the US to pursue a real one China policy, not a fake one China policy. We require the US to fill its commitments to China, not act treacherously. We require the US to truly implement the one China policy through action rather than saying one thing and doing another. This and ongoing shows of force against Taiwan recall the warnings Beijing issued in advance of its entry into the Korean War, the Sino Indian Border War of 1962 and the Sino-Vietnamese War of 1979, all of which warnings were ignored by those to whom they were directed, with sad consequences for them. The circumstances that would justify Beijing's using force against Taiwan are clearly spelled out in Article 8 of the 2005 Chinese anti-secession law. They are, first, if Taiwan independence forces, under whatever name and method, accomplish the fact of Taiwan's separation from China. Or second, if a major event occurs, which would lead to Taiwan's separation from China. Or third, if all possibility of peaceful unification is lost. The majority in Beijing now believe that changes in Taiwan's stance U.S. backing for these, and Washington's accelerating abandonment of the previously agreed framework for managing the Taiwan question have now combined to meet these criteria. The record shows that the clearer U.S. and other foreign support for Taiwan's continued separation from the rest of China becomes, the more affronted Beijing is, the likelier war is, and the higher the potential reputational cost to the United States of failing to intervene. There is no evidence that Beijing has decided to end the Chinese war by Chinese civil war by using force in any specific time frame. But the PLA is now well along in developing a full range of military options to prevail in future armed conflict over Taiwan whether or not the United States is part of it. Beijing is clearly signaling a willingness, however reluctant, to risk escalating military pressure on Taipei to bring it to the negotiating table. And if it doesn't come going to war to impose terms on it or conquer it. Military and other pressures on Taiwan of the sort we're seeing now can be calibrated and incremental. Conquest requires a swift and decisive knockout punch. China has been developing options to support everything from intimidating shows of force to the seizure of territory, the mining of harbors, the blockade of airspace, or outright assault on Taiwan with missile, cyber, air, and naval attacks, followed by amphibious and helicopter-borne landings. And my colleague and friend, Lyle Goldstein, will outline some of the th key things that China has already done and is doing to perfect these options. And Lyle, I now defer to you. Okay. Kira, 
Watson Institute, of course, I, I used to teach here, have great affection for this institution and uh, um, very excited to be coming back. So um, let me uh, spell out some of these uh, issues from a military perspective. And, uh, you know, I, I was just listening to a podcast yesterday where it was uh, remarked that, um, you know, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could stop talking about military issues in US China relations or, or just with China generally and, and I have to be, I'm very sympathetic to that point of view. Unfortunately, though, you know, sometimes as they say, uh, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. So we, um, we, I, I actually think as, as a China specialist, we need to be knowledgeable about these things or else, you know, the, the, the whole discourse will be, uh, will be um, carried on by people who know nothing about China, which I think is not what we want really. So, so I, you know, invite you to, to learn as much as you can and participate in this debate. It's critically important. Um, I, I agree with the economist here that, uh, that Taiwan, the Taiwan Strait is the most dangerous place on earth. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's right. Um, now, this is a very uh, disturbing graphic here. I, maybe I'll come to it at the end. Uh, it actually shows what uh, radiation plumes would look like after a nuclear strike in the United States. Uh, on that topic, you might want to look at this book. It's a fictional book by Admiral Stavridis, who was a senior foreign policy advisor to Hillary Clinton. But at the end, he predicts, so, you know, he envisions a war between the U.S. and China. How does it end? Well, you guessed it, with radiation plumes. Uh, you should read that book. It's not an easy book to read. Uh, there are problems with the book, but... Uh, to, to the author's credit, they did raise this possibility. What happens when two nuclear powers go to war? Well, it may end with radiation plumes. So uh, we'll get to that. But uh, let me cover some of these more basic points about the Taiwan issue. Uh, it's uh, here, I think this map, it helps us to see that some of the geography that's critically important. And indeed, I think it is geography really that's most decisive here as we consider this issue. So I, I'm compelled to briefly shout out this book, uh, Alan Walkman, a great friend of mine. We lost him. He lived near here, but he, he wrote uh, um, very skillfully on this very difficult issue. And in some ways he predicted what we're seeing today. Um, I think Chaz admirably covered the, a lot of the critical history. I'll just again, throw out one more book recommendation. If you haven't read this book by Tonio Andrade about the history of Taiwan, you know, Taiwan very well could have been Dutch, you know, maybe it could be a piece of Indonesia today. That's not how it worked out, folks. Read the history and uh, understand, um, you know, China, effectively the Dutch became involved in a Chinese civil war and China conquered Taiwan in, in 1683 and it became part of China at that point. Uh, that's important to understand that history. So do, do read this book, don't take my word for it. All right, let, let's talk about some of these military options and I'm gonna go rather quickly here. Um, so I think a show of force is very likely. In fact, uh, we're already seeing that, right? I mean, you, you all have seen the, uh, these aircraft uh, patterns. By the way, I, I think it actually, in some ways, this is exaggerated. Um, you know, if, if China were to, uh, you know, wants to fly uh, in all areas of central China, whether military or civilian, it's going to fly through that very large uh, air defense zone. So we can talk about the particularities of the air defense zone, but it, in my view, the press, doesn't quite understand these, not violations of Taiwan airspace. That, that's something quite different. Um, but, you know, let's face it, this is a form of, of intimidation at the same time. Uh, and China has all kinds of tools for intimidation. Uh, carriers, they're great for intimidation. We, we know something about that. Uh, my former employer does. I used to work for the Navy for 20 years. Um, but of course it can get uh, much more serious than that even. Uh, if one can imagine. And uh, you all know, Chinese are very fond of military parades. And uh, I don't doubt that on the first day of a major Taiwan crisis, uh, we would see a uh, parading of equipment we haven't seen previously. And that may include uh, substantially more nuclear weapons even than we thought. And in fact, uh, that's being discussed a lot. Okay, we'll, we'll come to nuclear issues, but let's look at some more of these, uh, let's say, um, uh, limited options that China has. They have many of them. Uh, I, I happen to know a lot about the Chinese Navy. I spent the last two decades studying it, but it, they, let me emphasize they're fully capable of implementing a very strong blockade against Taiwan. And I have no doubt uh, also that Taiwan is quite vulnerable to this blockade, especially in terms of energy 
uh, and even food, if you can imagine. Uh, so th this could be a major problem. Uh, China has many tools here, including the submarine force, uh, which is, uh, has been experienced kind of dynamic growth. And we can discuss that. Some of the details there, uh, certainly uh, the aerial component of this blockade is also robust and includes you know, a lot of things one would need to execute a blockade like uh, you know, good surveillance uh, tools and so forth. These are very robust now. Uh, and um, you know, China has been working on sort of the details of this. And that would include, as, uh, as Chaz Freeman just alluded, uh, you know, mining, for example. And you can use all kinds of tools to mine. And mines are very good for stopping uh, submarines, for example, if they need to do that. That would be a more intense uh, discussion now here, but looking into the future, and, and I think the future is quite bleak here, at least, I guess, from our side of things. And, and uh, you know, in the future, a lot of this uh, naval power, the naval contest may go on between robots. And, and this, I believe this vessel even is already out and about, um, not part of the fleet yet, but uh, it's quite extraordinary. This thing can take on aircraft, it can uh, zip around and, and do surveillance, and it can even uh, take a shot at a submarine. So, you know, this is in a way is the future of naval power. And I think uh, China could quite convincingly police up the Taiwan uh, situation, uh, even with, with uh, you know, robot boats. And, and uh, it doesn't have to, of course, it has much more capability than that. But I'm just saying this is uh, well within its grasp and, and would be difficult for our side to deal with. Um, okay, uh, what about a limited attack? And here, you know, I, I I think this is, uh, you know, we could say this, this is quite a strong possibility because here China may see the risk calculus as in its favor. Uh, and here uh, I would point out tiny Dongsha, which is, um, I think uh, Ambassador Freeman has been calling attention a lot to this possibility in particular uh, because it's, it's not hardly defended at all. Uh, and uh, it would be, um, you know, something that, that could, would, would take uh, you know, just a couple of hours, if that even, uh, to, for China to uh, grasp in its control. And also you can see how it, it lies across that very critical uh, sea lane south of Taiwan and north of the Philippines. And so it's actually quite a, a uh, valuable strategic position in Taiwan. i uh, sorry, the mainland probably would not mind to acquire that position as well as sending a warning. So that's one possibility. Another possibility, which I think maybe is, I personally think is quite likely is a step uh, toward the Penghu's and the Penghu's are a larger set of islands, significantly larger. You can see the island group there in the larger map. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, just, just 20 miles off of Taiwan, off the West Coast. And I think this is quite a likely possibility. I've, you can take your own tour through Google, uh, Google Maps and, and see your, for yourself. Uh, by the way, I, it, one can imagine what a General Eisenhower would have done with Google Maps and Google Earth before uh, Normandy. It would have been very useful, but you know, the fact is the, the mainland is able to see a lot of Taiwan better in, in incredible fidelity, including the Penghu's. Uh, and this is how it actually went down in 1683, as Ambassador Freeman has pointed out many times that Penghu's were the stepping stone. So this seems to me a very likely scenario, but let's talk about the, the big enchiladas who were, and uh, I don't mean, you know, I don't know that cartoons and jokes are appropriate. I mean, we, we are talking about something very, um, really awful, uh, but let's consider nevertheless, as Hugh White says, uh, he's a, uh, a, a wonderful uh, analyst in Australia. He said, you have to, you know, you have to unfortunately imagine a, a catastrophe in order to prevent it. So that's what we're doing. Um, well, uh, among military analysts, we argue a lot about this ship. This is the Type 075. It's a new, uh, new, a large amphibious attack ship. And many have said, well, this is the final indicator that we needed when they build, you know, sufficient number of these, then they, it will be T-Day. Uh, I don't happen to agree with that analysis. I think it, it, uh, it overstates the importance of of these ships and uh, you see they land amphibious tanks and so forth. My view, uh, here's just a picture from uh, last week actually, it was working out with a uh, air cushion craft. It's not to say they're not useful. Of course they are for amphibious attack. This is frankly how we do it. Uh, so to the extent that, you know, a little bit of mirror imaging could be going on there. But uh, my view, however, is uh, 
uh, China is quite likely to go with an unconventional approach here, um, uh, more stealthy, more low tech. And, and there I commend you to consider uh, just how much effort China has put into small boats here. And uh, this is just uh, 90 miles, folks. So this, in my view, is a, a totally feasible way to get across. Uh, that is, it's not to say the small boats launch off of Fujian, it's that they go aboard much larger boats and they're, they're unloaded if they go over the side. Uh, sure, it's not the ideal way and you probably get wet, but uh, the troops do get ashore and uh, in large numbers, and it's very hard to deal with these uh, pesky little boats. Uh, and indeed, uh, I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest this is uh, actually China's approach. And uh, those big ships are kind of a red herring uh, and, and may well be sunk, but it wouldn't make a big difference in my view. Um, and here are some other innovative ways that China will uh, support that effort. For example, this, uh, this, this picture just appeared last week from a Chinese defense show. And uh, you can see this is a kind of aircraft carrier for drones, as it were, smaller, of course, but the kind of drone you can see over there, uh, that would be perfect for lifting all those bullets uh, that need to be moved to those uh, infantry forces. It's mostly an infantry fight, folks. It's, these are mountains and cities, mostly on Taiwan. It's not like the, uh, you know, the North European plain where you have these massive tank battles. I don't think that's in the offing. So the point is China has what it needs in my view, uh, just to play this out a little bit more. Uh, boy, it'd be great to, uh, I mean, from China's perspective, they, they want to land a lot of troops uh, on the island that this picture is very hard to see, but that's partly by design. It's a night operation and China is practicing landing airborne troops at night. And that's, it's very difficult, it's very dangerous, but that's, you know, that's what we did at Normandy and that's what they intend to do in this case, in my view, and they will be helped a lot by drones. And again, uh, I'm quite sure uh, General Eisenhower would have loved to have some drones to help his forces across. <laughs> China will have an enormous force of drones supporting their effort. And uh, these are just from last week looking at Chinese paratroopers. So China's putting enormous effort at this. And I think part of the idea there is you don't really have to control the sea if you control the air. And uh, that, you know, from a military strategy point of view, that's, that's quite an innovative concept for taking an island. But if the island is only 90 miles off your shores, this is quite feasible. Uh, all kinds of effort at uh, developing elite troops. Uh, you know, we're probably misled by just looking at the numbers um, alone. You know, people make suggestions that the mainland has to you know, put 3 million troops on the island or something. I, I don't buy that at all. It's, it could be a much smaller force, an elite force. Indeed, the, you know, when the Brits came to the Falklands, for example, they had, you know, significantly smaller forces than the Argentine, but they were elite troops. And that's what makes the difference. Uh, and then the Hell Helleborn forces that uh, Ambassador Freeman was alluding to, it's, it's quite extensive, folks. Uh, seeing it every day on the Chinese military news, training a lot of helicopter pilots there. But again, when you're talking about 100 miles across the strait, this is a very feasible way to go. Okay, so, and one last thing, paving the way for all of this, uh, these parts of the assault are, is just a massive uh, use of firepower here. And I, I didn't say, you know, I wouldn't wanna be anywhere near that island and it, it, uh, it will be a terrible onslaught, I think. Uh, and these are among the weapons. This is very handy if you want to rain fire down in, a, in an area that's about 100, 100 to 200 miles away. Uh, this is an economic way to do it. And China has really mastered this technology. Um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. But this slide is particularly important because it uh, one counter argument here is to say, well, you know, it all comes down to submarines in modern naval power. And, you know, the exercise of U.S. and allied submarines would actually win the day, but I, I really disagree with that. Um, and, uh, you know, part of it is spelled out in this RAND study where they produced this um, map. You can see minefields on both sides of the strait to protect the forces there. And, uh, you know, my conclusion is uh, that uh, US submarines would not be able to stop an amphibious attack. Uh, as I said, most of it coming by helicopter or by, by aircraft anyway. Uh, but the Chinese have developed many counters to submarines as well, including mines, uh, like you see in these minefields, but, but also Coast Guard vessels and light frigates. And so they, they've been thinking this through for well over a decade, and I think they've got it. Um, now, uh, I think Ambassador Freeman wanted to weigh in again uh, before we talk about nuclear issues.
I think the, uh, the conventional military capabilities and scenarios that Lyle has just outlined are, are these are the focus of US attention and they've been the basis for the complacent assumption that there would be plenty of warning of, of any use of force by the PLA against Taiwan because you have to move troops forward and concentrate helicopters and so forth. But the obvious alternative to frontal assault is an offshore bombardment of Taiwan by the PLA rocket forces, coupled with crippling cyber attacks, special forces, which Lyle mentioned, and fifth column operations, which are very likely, as well as air attacks to destroy Taiwan's ability to defend itself and pave the way for the PLA Army and Marines to move into position to accept Taiwan's surrender or complete its conquest. Such an approach would reduce warning time to near zero, produce chaos on the island, facilitate the decapitation of the current leadership, open the way for that leadership's replacement by mutineers or quislings, and enable the invasion and occupation of the island. And this raises a question, are we now focused on PLA activities that are diversionary rather than real? Maybe we're looking at the wrong indicators of an attack. Standoff bombardment and other saturation attacks on Taiwan's defenses do demand a thoroughly convincing deterrent to US intervention. So China is heavying up and diversifying its nuclear arsenal to sustain an assured retaliatory capability, probably based on launch on warning, and very likely including the development of a credible first strike capability. And again, I defer to Lyle, and I'll just sit here while you right, think. Right, right, you know, just a couple more ideas here. Uh, you know, visually, I think it's always important to, to um, try to grasp this, uh, what China is doing, and, and maybe look at to this from China's point of view a little bit, but uh, indeed, you know, the, the news over the last six months has been really terrible on this front. I mean, having watched uh, the China security issue for, for several decades now, uh, we, we were pretty confident that China felt uh, secure in its uh, deterrent. But I think increasingly what we're seeing now is uh, China is, is, uh, feels a strong need to uh, refurbish and, um, and, and uh, have a much more robust uh, nuclear force. So um, I, I gather you, you have seen the news. For this uh, first uh, announcements of this came over the summer from some satellite photography. You have three different locations in uh, Western China where a lot of silos are being built, uh, potentially as many as uh, 300 new silos. It's not clear that all of those silos will be filled with missiles. Uh, but it is. It does seem that uh, these are now uh, more or less confirmed by uh, by U.S. Department of Defense and, and the intelligence agencies with the latest uh, news from two weeks ago. I think um, you know General Milley said this is a historic change in the balance of power. Now, I, I mean, I think there is a danger of us exaggerating what's going on, of course, too. But uh, you know, no question in my mind that there is a um, a new approach. And this didn't start yesterday. You know, these decisions were probably made uh, uh, at least three or four, maybe maybe even ten years ago. And I, I have watched, you know, the Chinese debate. You know, do we have enough? You know, is the fundamental question. Uh, this map, interesting. You know, these, if you, if you look closely, it's a map of the United States. Why are they? You know, they, they're actually looking at our ICBM fields. And and one of the questions, as I looked at that article. Uh, one of the questions they're asking, why does the United States why do, maintain these uh, ICBM fields when they know that they are you know, targeted? Um, and, and one of the explanations for this new buildup of these sites is that it's meant as simply to absorb the adversary strikes. You, know, you have to expend a lot of your arsenal to destroy these uh, giant ICBM fields. So that is a distinct possibility. Um, Ambassador Freeman mentioned another, which is really disturbing, which is the Another use for ICBM fields is, is to maintain, you know, more or less try to maintain a kind of a first strike threat. That is, you have the ability to 
uh, threaten your enemy with, you know, essentially with annihilation in a first strike. Now, that's in a way is inconceivable because we uh, we know that that our forces, you know, submarines and so forth are invulnerable. So this in a sense that shouldn't keep us up at night, but it is it, it does make one wonder if we're looking at a kind of new leap in uh, Chinese nuclear strategy away from the minimal deterrent. Um, I, I prefer to think of their approach as, as, you know, let's build a big sponge and absorb uh, in the worst case. But uh, there's more to this. The, the hypersonic effort uh, is there. I hear they're talking about a successful strike. What I think it's important people realize that China has deployed hypersonic weapon here. They paraded it a couple of years ago, the DF-17. So Russia has a deployed hypersonic weapon. Too. The United States does not. So that's uh, something to think about it. I think this makes, uh, you know, at some level that makes the defense industry very eager to build these, but it also should caution us about the future of uh, arms racing and that, that indeed we are arms racing at this point with determined opponents. Um, I have uh, been very concerned about hypersonic weapons. They can take hypersonic uh, weapons can deliver conventional or nuclear warheads and can be deployed from all, you know, even from submarines and so forth. One of these just flew around the world that we're told. Uh, now, <laughs> you remember the book 2034 that I recommended, right? You should read it. You may not enjoy reading it, but you should read it. Well, the Chinese have been reading it too. And here's a little summary. And you can see um, it among many things, inspiring them to get a serious. Uh, <laughs> this map of uh, submarine launch missile ranges, I noted that Providence is just a little bit outside the, the estimated range for the for the uh, next version of the I'm Julong saying. missile. So, so maybe we're okay. But uh, <laughs> no, the truth is, I think China has a, already has a robust deterrent. But what I'm reading from their sources is that their conclusion is that uh, Ameri some Americans believe this, maybe at Brown and places like that, but many Americans do not. And their, you know, their idea is we have to get all Americans to believe this. That's kind of the concept. Uh, but here you see some mention in one of their studies by a Fudan professor, but he was saying, gosh, you know, the Americans have talked about nuclear weapons in the Taiwan Strait, so we should too. And it, it, here, here's more of this argument from a professor at, at Tsinghua, where he says, you need to dispel U.S. strategic opportunism that flows from U.S. nuclear superiority. Okay, that makes logical sense, I guess. All right, uh, the uh, last words here. Uh, I think people, some people in this room have studied the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, are we about to see that? And you, here's a dissertation and some more discussion of uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and what it means. And, and actually, these these papers both call for rationality as the as the key to getting through a crisis like this. And you know, this is we may want to have a, a more uh, robust dialogue with Chinese colleagues uh, about this. Um, so, final slide here, uh, just. We can come back to this in the Q and A if people are interested. I, unfortunately, I will have to leave immediately after uh, one thirty because I have another. Um, we're doing another session on on Taiwan, if you can believe it. But the, um, in my view, these these we we're not we don't have a balance. We have imbalance, and uh, I think uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, in any case, it is what it is. The facts are what they are, which is that the. Uh, you know, the PLA has really established military dominance in and around Taiwan. So this is uh, something we have to reckon with. And, you know, I, I uh, this is why we need to take Ambassador Freeman's uh, words on this particularly seriously. This could happen. So uh, let me leave it there. And maybe maybe we can get rid of well, the slides. The, um, just to follow up on what Lyle just said, um, um, Taiwan's defense minister has said, the that China now has the capability to use force to take Taiwan in less than two weeks. So um, I would say that PLA planners assume the United States will intervene, although we have no commitment to do so. And Taiwan's planners are betting that we will intervene. The only certainty is that a war would leave Taiwan and its democracy in smoking ruins. Now, the US and China are, as Lyle said, are in an arms race. China's confidence in its ability to defeat us is growing. And so is our doubt that we could prevail. In the case of Taiwan, time is not on the side of US intervention. 
And here I want to make a key point. America's allies and security partners have always looked to Washington to manage the Taiwan issue with Beijing. None would welcome a takeover of Taiwan by Beijing, but none has formally agreed to join the United States in a war over the issue. For 40 years, the US managed its and Taipei's differences with Beijing through diplomacy backed by military deterrence. Washington's assurances to Beijing that it would not support unilateral changes in the status quo by Taiwan made a war over Taiwan seem unnecessary. This enabled deterrence at reasonable cost and with minimal risk. Now diplomacy has vanished. It has been replaced by a purely military approach of escalating US threats, confrontation and nuclear, as well as con uh, conventional arms races between the two countries. In this context, what was once deterrent of Beijing is now provocative. Although the United States when press still declares that it does not support independence for Taiwan. President Biden attempted to do this and got it a bit garbled, uh, but anyway, that's what he apparently meant. We don't support independence for Taiwan. It now appears to the United States now appears to be opposed to any form of reunification however it might be achieved, where it once opposed unilateral change in the status quo by either Beijing or Taipei, now appears to oppose such change only if it's engineered by Beijing. In these circumstances, Beijing can see no peaceful path to the successful defense of China's unity, sovereignty, and territorial and integrity, and an end to foreign spheres of influence on Chinese soil. So as Lyle demonstrated, it's doing what it must to be able to resolve the issue by military means. Whether it judges it must finally use force will be decided by whether the United States and Taipei continue to deny it realistic alternatives to the use of force. The November 15, 16, 16 in Beijing, 15 here, virtual summit between Presidents Biden and Xi Jinping affirmed China's red lines and restated US policy in terms that Chinese consider to be word games. It left the Taiwan issue to fester without so-called guardrails. Despite some brave talk in Taipei, Taiwan's current leaders behave as though they believe that they need do only the bare minimum to defend themselves we can talk about this. Because American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines will be prepared to die. And Americans will be willing to risk nuclear retaliation against our homeland to back Taiwan's perpetual separation from China. Should we do that? Will we? I think the risks are now too grave to permit wishful thinking. As Lyle said, we need to base our answers to these questions on a realistic appraisal of Chinese military capabilities, as well as Taiwan's and our own. The PLA can now bring overwhelming military power to bear on Taiwan. How much of a fight is Taiwan prepared to put up if Beijing is goaded into attack or decides it must impose a solution? If the United States intervenes in a war over Taiwan, how much meaningful support from allies and security partners would we really have? What would our other design designated adversary, Russia, do to take advantage of a Taiwan crisis? As Vietnam did, China cares deeply about national unity and immunity from foreign intervention. We fought bravely in Vietnam, but we lost because Hanoi, despite its military inferiority, cared far more about the outcome than we did. Hanoi was prepared to sacrifice everything to reunify its country. We were not willing to do as much to keep it divided. Do our concerns about Taiwan match or exceed those of Chinese nationalists? Are we prepared to risk our cities over Taiwan's status? 
what sacrifices in lives and treasure are Americans prepared to make to assure a unilateral self-determination for Taiwan? How would we terminate a war with China over that issue? And on what terms? I think we need to get real. If Taiwanese want self-determination in the form of maximum autonomy or even independence from China, that's their right. But it's up to them to achieve it. To secure the status they desire, they must persuade Beijing to accept it. Americans cannot do this for them. And we should not pretend we can. In 1775, Americans were only able to achieve self-determination from our British motherland through six years of bitter warfare and two years of tough negotiations. No foreigner can decide, either at the negotiating table or on the battlefield, what relationship Taiwanese have with their Chinese motherland. The parties to the unended Chinese Civil War must, must do this themselves. They alone can determine what sacrifices they are prepared to make, to preserve, enhance, or extinguish Taiwan's current de facto autonomy. Now, 200 years ago, in comparable circumstances, as political pressure mounted to support the Greek struggle for independence from the Ottoman Empire, Secretary of State John Quincy Adams judiciously declared, quote, wherever the standard of freedom and independence has been or shall be unfurled, there will be America's heart, her benedictions and her prayers. But she goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She is the well-wisher to the freedom of independence and all, of all. She is the champion and vindicator only of her own. Adams was an American nationalist and realist whose statesmanship prudently put America and its interests first. America and the world are better for his having done so. And I think we Americans need to think long and hard about alternatives to the war we are casually brewing up over Taiwan. Such a war will not end well for Taiwan, for China, or for us. Taiwan and the mainland need to talk. The United States needs to encourage this, not pursue policies that appear to make cross-strait dialogue unnecessary. Now China and the United States need to return to managing the Taiwan issue not using it to provide the focus for a military showdown that can only be a disaster for all concerned. Thank you. And we're ready for questions or comments. We'll open it up to questions, but maybe I'll just ask a, a quick follow-up on your conclusion, Chaz. So if I understand your, your point, um, it's that the mainland has a clear long-term ambition to unify the nation, take Taiwan, and it has developed the military capabilities now to do so. The US then should, should use di diplomacy, if I understand right, basically to facilitate that unification. No, I don't think so. I think we found a method earlier, 40 years ago, uh, to manage the Taiwan question. Um, that depended on establishing mutual trust and confidence. Um, I would say that the handling of U.S.-China relations by this administration, as well as its predecessor, has been shockingly inept. Just think about it. If I approach you and I say, I despise you, your values are totally dreadful. I will do everything I can to keep you down or push you down. But I need your help on a couple of things. Um, can I count on you? Um, where would you get? But that is the approach we have been taking to the management of relations with China. It wouldn't be that hard for the administration, instead of leading with, we have an adversarial relationship, we are our competitors, but we're prepared to do a little bit of competition Co cooperation where it suits us to reverse that and say, we think this relationship should be basically cooperative. We have a lot to gain from cooperation, but there are elements that are competitive and there are even some that are adversarial. 
but let's try to manage this in a way that benefits both countries and the world. That would be a diplomatic approach. So a very, a very savvy, nuanced kind of diplomacy to impede, arguably, forceful, this coercive unification, which China, as you and Lyle have demonstrated, now has developed capabilities to achieve. That's a very tall order, as opposed to what seems to be the more, you know, quote unquote, obvious or reflexive move, which is to attempt to deter that unification with ever greater. Uh, yeah, let, let me say a word about deterrence, because I think this is generally important in foreign relations and diplomacy. Now, deterrence bottles up problems. That's its purpose. Um, it threatens. And it says, if you change this, you're going to pay a price. So you bottle up the problem. And we're very good at that. We did that in Korea. You bottled up the problem. We actually made a commitment in the armistice agreement to take the next step, which was to begin to, to address the problem of a divided Korea. We didn't do that. Uh, we instead adopted a policy of maximum pressure. And the result is that North Korea has developed an ICBM with a nuclear warhead that is aimed somewhere in the United States um, and is busily proceeding uh, to add a submarine launched capability on top of that. Uh, we should learn, you know, if you deter things, that's not the end of it. You have to deal with the question of whether the problem is going to fester and get worse uh, or whether you have an opportunity uh, to make it go away. Uh, in the case of Taiwan, we had 70 years to make it go away. We did nothing except in the end deter. And now we're stuck. The dog has caught the car. Mm. Now what do you do? <laughs> Questions? And I'm going to just pass around, hard to pass around the microphone for our online audience. Hey, thank you for the talk. Um, uh, my question is, um, could Taiwan sustain an uh, insurgency uh, that could eventually bleed China dry uh, like Afghanistan did in the US? Um, I think the answer to that is um, best uh, given through history. In 1895, uh, Japan, which had briefly, briefly occupied Taitung, in 1878 came back and took the island. And uh, it was there until 1945. Um, people forget that from 1895 to 1930, uh, Japan was faced a constant rebellion in Taiwan. Um, some of the rebellion was from the Han population on the island, the Chinese, uh, people from Fujian who are uh, Minnan speakers or Hakka speakers. Uh, some of it was from Aborigines. In the, you can go into the mountains in Taiwan and see the monuments to the tribes that Japan committed genocide on with nerve gas. Uh, what you don't see is monuments to the many Han who gave their lives trying to throw out Japanese control. Taiwan in those days was rural, rural in, Insurgencies are easy to manage. Um, if you want to imagine what the Chinese response would be to an insurgency in Taiwan, look at Xinjiang. Uh, in some respects, unfortunately, that may be a trial run. Um, and uh, I would add that when the Kuomintang came to Taiwan, it too faced uh, unrest. And the result was the so-called Tsitsipue or, or RRPA, February 28th incident in which uh, some 28,000 Taiwanese intellectuals were shot in the head. Um, US, of course, since Chiang Kai-shek was our great friend and ally, did nothing about that. Um, so um, uh, I think the answer is no. Uh, uh, that is, you said to sustain. I think certainly an, an insurgency might be mounted, 
I wouldn't give it any chance of succeeding. Uh, could I uh, come in quickly? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think I think um, I certainly agree with what Chaz just laid out, and and the um, that some of that history that he just was discussing about Taiwan is actually uh, in uh, very, very well uh, discussed in Ezra Vogel's book. If, you've, if you're familiar with that uh, excellent book on on uh, China Japan relations, he talks about Japan's occupation and how brutal they were in exterminating the insurgency there. Um, but I would also just add that, um, you know, watching the Chinese military, as I do, it's quite extraordinary how much effort the Chinese military puts at the uh, so-called people's armed police. Uh, not only do they have a really fat budget, um, I believe they're more than a half a million strong. And you can wonder what do half a million uh, very well-trained, um, you know, almost elite troops do all day. Well, part of what they're practicing for is the occupation. Um, let and, me just uh, let me just say finally that I've had a lot of discussions over the years with senior, very senior military people in the PLA. The last thing on earth they want to do is get into an occupation in Taiwan. They've seen what occupations look like. I wrote a book uh, called Arts of Power, which on a few pages discussed the consequences of occupation for a professional army. Uh, it corrodes the fighting ability of the army. It corrupts it. It puts the army into the position of judiciary and police, which they're not trained or equipped to do. Therefore, I argued this before we proved my point in Iraq, um, the faster the army can turn over responsibility for internal security to police, uh, civilian authorities, or perhaps armed civilian authorities, the better for everyone. Um, that passage caught the attention of the general staff in Beijing, and they translated the book for that reason. Uh, so I think there's no doubt about the uh, interest of the, of, of the Chinese Communist Party in settling the civil war, which began with the Guangdong and is now morphed into an independence struggle uh, by Taiwan. Uh, but the difficulties in the way of that are considerable. Democratic politicians are very unable, as our own example unfortunately demonstrates, to make hard choices. They're much better at punting than they are at throwing a Hail Mary pass, to use a football analogy. Other questions? One down here. There's someone here. That's okay, we'll, we'll get to everybody. Thanks. This guy in the blue shirt. It's a pleasure to see and hear both of you. Um, my question is related to uh, why would we not seek a more Westphalian uh, approach to the question of China and US relations? Um, for instance, uh, the fact that China has um, elevated more than 850 million of its own population out of dire poverty and has said that they uh, put a branch out to the whole world to solve the poverty of the whole world in 30 or 40 years. Why would we not approach these relationships uh, and, and you know take that uh, branch as a, a means to solve the problem that we have on a much more nobler plane. So my question is, why would would uh, we not, you know, accept this as the pathway towards relations between China uh, and the United States, rather than dwelling on the past and dwelling within the realm of you know military? Uh, we we have probably the biggest military arsenal. Anyways, that's my... Well, we, um, uh, the military industrial complex is us. Um, we have a very militarized foreign policy. Uh, our first thought when we run into a problem abroad is uh, sanctions, which is coercive. As a, it is a form of war, it is an economic war. And then we send in the Marines. 
or if the Marines aren't available, the army or somebody. Um, uh, this is our mentality. And it comes out of our history, I suppose. You are very rational. Uh, that, that is exactly what I think we should be doing. That is, we should accept that there is no military answer uh, that is acceptable to the Taiwan question, either for China or for us. And we need to find a way to take it off the track that it's now on toward a fight. Um, having said that, um, I don't know about you, but I think uh, at the moment, Americans have no consensus on what the past means, what our, our founding myths are all being deconstructed. Our heroes are being toppled from their pedestals. New heroes are not really being invented that appeal to everyone. We are more divided than ever. We don't agree on what the present is and we have no common vision of the future. And if you doubt that, look at Washington DC at present. So to go back to what Ed said, China has a clear ambition and a strategy for achieving it. And we are countering it with fumbling and internal division and a focus on military uses of force. Lyle, you want to add something, I think? Oh, yeah, I would just like to, uh, um, I, th I think this is a very wise question. And, you know, for those of you not familiar with uh, 17th century European diplomacy, uh, this term, the Westphalian model, I think is, is something we really ought to get back to. And I think it is uh, generally studied in international relations mm -hmm. classes, but I don't think it's known beyond that, but I'm glad you brought it up because I do think it's uh, absolutely critical to a way forward with China. I mean, it, and it, all it is is a basic principle that, you know, um, countries can be different, and probably should be different, and uh, they shouldn't interfere in each other's affairs. And uh, this eventually stopped the uh, incredible warring that was going on between, you know, various Catholic and Protestant states in Central Europe. But I mean, it's very applicable to today. And uh, most diplomats, um, you know, agree with these uh, basic principles. But it seems to me, I I'm not sure why this is, you know, completely broken down in the modern discourse. Uh, on international politics, but uh, I, I have a feeling it has something to do with um, uh, Twitter and journalism and, and cable news and all this and, and uh, kind of democracy run amok. But uh, I think uh, George Kennan and people like that would certainly favor returning to, as it were, to the old ways, to, the, to this understanding that it's, it's quite normal that countries are run in very different ways and to resist the temptation to constantly be um, telling other countries how to how to run their affairs just on, on this point though um in the 90s mid 90s or even in the earlier 2000s when various um tensions have risen or crises occurred in the taiwan streets i, th I think one could argue that taiwan was the non-status quo player that the people were pushing for something closer to independence and were using that kind of discourse it doesn't seem to me to be the case today, though, that I'm no expert on Taiwan, but it doesn't seem that there's a particularly vocal discourse on Taiwan about independence relative to what was happening a decade or more ago. So if, if that characterization is right, that Taiwan is effectively either a status quo player at this point or has been cowed to some extent by the capabilities developed on the mainland, then I think it's not quite as obvious that the position of the US should be hands off or that it, it should, I know Chaz, you didn't suggest this, but that it should simply draw a line beyond that doesn't include Taiwan as had been done prior well, to the Korean let, War. Let me, let me answer that with, in two parts. Uh, first, it is not the case that Taiwan uh, is not shifting the, the status quo. Um, Chen Shui-bian, previous president in Taiwan, uh, first uh, independence advocate to be president, uh, said, uh, bien equal, uh, one country on each side of the strait. Uh, Tsai Ing-wen says, there's no need to declare independence because we are independent. Sure. Now, that is not consistent with one China 
as a principle which enabled discussion across the strait, uh, which her party uh, repudiates as a principle. Um, so, it, 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 but Tsai Ing-wen is just the president. Uh, Joseph Wu, who is the foreign minister, has been running around Europe promoting Taiwan independence directly, openly, and, and, and so forth, and takes great pride in having uh, seduced the government of Lithuania into um, offering Taiwan a separate common Taiwan office. I mean, the pattern up to now had been that Taiwan had informal trade relation offices and so forth, and everybody dealt with it substantively, but ducked the issue of whether it was a state or not. Um, now it is asserting that it is a separate state. Uh, in fact, that was Li Danghui's contribution in 1999, uh, Liang Guolun, the two state theory or doctrine. Uh, it's two Chinas. Now it's one China, one Taiwan. Taiwan has pushed this very hard and they are pushing lobbying in Congress for more support for independence as well. You know, at the same time, Taiwan's defense expenditure budget is less than 2% of GDP. Um, its divisions are manned at the 60% level. It is not preparing uh, the kind of defense that, sorry, I don't, didn't get your name, but you asked a very good question about uh, insurgency, uh, making Taiwan an unpalatable prize. Um, Taiwan's armed services now depend, they used to have two year conscription. Uh, now they have four months of training for, for, on a volunteer basis. They can't staff their air force. They don't have the pilots um, and so forth and so on. And so we've got on the one hand, greater ambition for independence more openly expressed. And on the other hand, less effort at self-defense. Uh, so uh, that is, uh, that is the first part of it. And the second part of your question, you had, it was really two parts. One is Taiwan pushing this, oh, should the US um, uh, write off Taiwan? Uh, of course not, uh, we never have. Uh, 40 some years ago, we did a deal that preserved Taiwan, enabled it to end martial law, become democratic and have, and talk with the mainland about a modus vivendi. For a long time, it didn't, but in 1992, uh, it actually did meet with the mainland in Hong Kong and Singapore uh, and, and produce uh, a, a kind of modus vivendi for enabling cooperation across the strait. I don't remember the year, but Ma ying Zhou, who was the previous president of Taiwan, actually met with Xi Jinping in Singapore. So something was going along and it's now ended and reversed. Um, guardrails, just a word on guardrails, which is a favorite word in Washington. Hulan in Chinese. Uh, what, what does this mean? Uh, it means a barrier. So what does it mean in practice? We want guardrails on this relationship so we can keep doing everything we're now doing, even though it's provocative to the Chinese, but they can't push back because there are guardrails that protect our active patrolling of their coast, our freedom of navigation, so-called operations, challenging their sovereignty in over islands, our support for Japan in the Jiaoyu or Senkaku Islands dispute, and our continued salami slicing with regard to Taiwan. Wow, gee, I wonder why that isn't getting anywhere. Um, anyway, um, I think it's not true. I think the mainland has been very constant. What I worry about, frankly, is that this Xi Jinping just gave President Biden a very direct warning. If things continue on the current course, we will have to take drastic action. This is what he said. Uh, I think it is a danger that he's now feels he's checked the box about warning the president of the United States. And there will be no more warnings, although there will be a lot of noise in the press. Uh, this is not a good situation. And I think what we're trying to do today is not just to argue for 
a particular policy, uh, except to argue that we're being foolish to ignore the military consequences of the direction in which we're going. We have to take those into account and we have to make decisions. We are not making any decisions. We are thinking we can get something for nothing. And in the world, that generally doesn't work out. I think. Michael. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much um, to both Ambassador Fresh uh, Freeman and uh, Mr. Gonsain. But uh, I'm a senior here at Brown, studying international relations. My name is Michael. And my question is Ambassador Freeman, you talk about how. The key to resolving this is in a more internal manner that Taiwan would need to be the one initiating some discussions uh, and negotiations. My question here would be either do you think they are ready for it or what do we would it take for them to be ready for it? Would it be a U.S. change of attitude? Would it be the further deterioration of military escalation? And is democracy something that they should be willing to give up? Um, I don't think they're willing to give up democracy, but they're putting it at risk because if there is a war, there will be no democracy or prosperity on Taiwan. Um, so let's just stipulate that. I think probably everyone in this room um, would prefer to live in a democracy than in something else. Uh, but um, that's a choice for people to make. Um, there's a little bit of relevant history here. Um, back in, is it 1996 when? When was the gentleman eight point proposal? Um, I don't remember, but it was anyway, the end of the last century um, and uh, reiterated in 2003 again. Beijing said to Taipei, look, let's agree on reunification. Here's the formula. You can keep your army. You are responsible for defending your part of China. Mm -hmm. you, we will not send any military to Taiwan we will not even have a civilian official station in Taipei, but you can send people to Beijing to help govern China. That was their offer. You keep your democracy, your foreign economic relations, you keep your political system, but you agree you're part of China and we work out some range. That was the offer. Uh, that is, you know, ta Taiwan has never been able to respond to that because it is a democracy and people are justly suspicious. And after the debacle in Hong Kong, which I would say is not clearly the fault of the mainland, people in Hong Kong had a lot to do with contriving it. Um, after that, I, it's hard to blame people in Taiwan for being suspicious. Uh, so is there any real prospect that they will rise to the occasion? No. And why should they, when members of Congress fly in there and tell them to hang tough? And when uh, the United States says, well, we oppose unilateral change in the situation in the Strait, but we're aiding and abetting unilateral change along the lines that I described in, in answer to Ed. Um, the problem is, uh, we've been playing, to quote a Chinese friend, we've been playing word games with ourselves. But our words have zero credibility now in Beijing. Qing qi and guan qi xing, that's what you hear. Uh, listen to the words, but watch what people do. Because what they do is what counts. And what we're doing is not consistent with a one China outcome. So I, I'm very pessimistic about the possibility uh, that Taiwan will respond to the continued overtures from Beijing for talks. And those, those overtures, by the way, go back to the 1950s. People don't realize Chiang Kai-shek used to carry on an active correspondence with Zhou Enlai via a guy named Victor Louis, who was a Russian so-called journalist. Um, <laughs> who was in and out of Taipei. Remember that Jiang Jingguo, the, the great man who changed Taiwan much for the better, um, many people on the mainland admire him. Uh, he, his wife was Russian. He was educated in the Soviet Union. Victor Louis was his friend. Um, 
So there was a courier taking behind our back, by the way, you know, we were not aware of it. Uh, you, you can find the, the, the letters in the, in the archives in Moscow, uh, but they don't reside at the CIA. You want to add something? No, no, I'm, uh, I'm learning on that, about that. I did not know about that. <laughs> Other questions in the back, maybe? Danny? Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm a little curious about the slides, uh, especially the one with, with which on which um, uh, no allies for the PLA is listed both as a <laughs> negative and a positive. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering uh, why that is. Thank you. Yeah, th this uh, it's not a joke. It's, uh, it, it's just intended to kind of uh, provoke a little bit. But uh, I, I, really, the simple answer is there are a lot of unknowns and we really don't know. Uh, how this would look, um, you know, and I, I might take that a step further by saying, you know, uh, it's often said that the PLA has no, no real combat experience in, in the last few decades. So, but I think it's worth noting that uh, the kind of um, combat experience that the U.S. has is, is generally has been fighting in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, which really, uh, I think military people would tell you mm, there's almost no correspondence between counterinsurgency warfare and high intensity air and naval warfare. So I, I, I would, I just want to um, ha help people understand that, that, you know, anybody who tells you they think they know exactly how this is going to go down, please be skeptical. Okay. Um, but on this question of allies, um, I think it's, it's a real question, as Ambassador Freeman said, it, it's not clear at all to me that uh, the United States will have, um, that, that, it's at, that its coalition will sort of uh, come together uh, and, and put up a, a, a coordinated resistance. Uh, I don't see that at all. I mean, possibly Australia, um, uh, Japan is a really big question mark. Uh, others out there, mm, I don't you know, Philippines, not really sure at all. Japan, you know, maybe. Uh, South Korea, I think is, is definitely a question mark. But so, so in a, in a sense, um, now you could say, well, China has no allies, right? I don't think North Korea is going to help them much, or or and Russia, or Pakistan. well, Pakistan, right? But but the point is, if you have no allies, you're not relying on anybody. I mean, the Russians love to say Russia's allies are the the air force, the navy, the ground, and the ground forces. Those are the allies. That's only the only other countries they're going to rely on. And I think there is something to that, right? I mean, your plans are that much more seamless. Your communications, your security. Uh, if for, for deception purposes, it's very advantageous. So having, you know, no allies ca can be an advantage. It's something to think about. There is a classic diplo diplomatic definition of an ally alliance, which is a mutual commitment to aid. Uh, not conditional, but if you get in trouble, I will help you. Um, the United States has very few allies. We have protected states. <laughs> they don't have any obligation to us. Uh, the case of Japan is a good one. Um, Australia is an exception. And here, let me make a brief, con well, I'd say the Chinese concept has been to avoid alliances because they are liabilities. For the same reason, George Washington argued for no entangling alliances. They just enable foreigners to get you into a fight you don't want to get into. Um, and the question is, what ally would China look to, other than possibly Russia, that might help it? Um, Russia and China have an entente, which is a limited partnership for a limited purpose. That might expand to take in a Taiwan contingency or a Donbass contingency, because the two might be connected, but it hasn't yet. And um, so Australia, uh, I think, is a is an ally of the United States. Australia has been with us in every war that we've fought uh, in uh, over the last more than 100 years. Uh, AUKUS, the Australia, uh, UK, US agreement, which will eventually provide supposedly uh, nuclear powered submarines to Australia 20 years from now. What do you think China's gonna do in the interim, in the, in the intervening 20 years? Sit back and do nothing? Um, first of all, this makes Australia a legitimate target for Chinese submarine warfare. Then they'll build the submarines to be able to do that. 
Second, to the extent that Australia appears to be an ally in the context of a Taiwan fight, uh, it's, it, we have just handed China a terrific way of signaling intent. So let imagine a crisis and the Chinese say quietly off camera, look, if you intervene, you may have to kiss off Chicago. Um, and if they don't say that publicly, so it's not, and we say, well, we, we have a you know, big huddle. We decide they can't be serious. So they fire a missile and hit one of the former British test sites in Australia, where there are no people, just radiation, to show they're serious. Or they fire a nuclear warhead at Bikini Atoll, which we thoroughly trashed with our own tests. You know, we're talking about, this is Cuban Missile Crisis type signaling. Um, is Australia gonna add anything to the fight? I don't think so, but it's just become a target for Chinese. We had a, a question, I'll get to you in a moment. We had a question from the online audience. Uh, a, a person online asks if the Chinese Civil War were to go hot again, would we expect conflict on the Korean Peninsula or perhaps in Ukraine? What, what, what would the chances of some kind of extension of the conflict be? There would be no immediate consequence on the Korean Peninsula unless the North Koreans thought that this was a distraction sufficient enough to enable them to attack the South, which would be suicidal on their part. Uh, South Korea is totally able to defend itself with or without US support. Uh, and uh, so I don't think, and South Korea, by the way, is not going to get involved in the Chinese civil war under any circumstances. Uh, China, uh, South Korea, Korea, the Korean peninsula has been invaded 72 times in its history, mostly from the North, sometimes from Japan. Koreans know very well but it does not pay to get into a war with China and they're not gonna do it. Um, but the question about Ukraine is more real. Yes, I, I think we, um, well, at the outset, it's worth saying, you know, Russia, China relations are, are growing uh, tighter and tighter. I, I have, have a book that I'm working on about that. Um, there's a lot of evidence of coordination uh, well, one reason that they're both leery of stepping into a formal alliance relationship is that they understand that both countries have um, all kinds of tensions around their borders and they don't want to be, uh, you know, sucked into a larger conflict. That said, though, I, I, I think there's enough evidence of strategic coordination and on various matters, you know, from from the Korean Peninsula to Afghanistan to um, to think that there could be some kind of coordination on the issue of uh, even of Donbass and or Ukraine and, and Taiwan. So I mean here what I'm thinking of is uh, as, as quite feasible where where the Chinese could say, hey look, we may indeed act on Taiwan and we need you to make a distraction and I, I could quite, to conceivably consider how Russia could create a distraction. I mean, we've seen there have been two, uh, we're, we're in a kind of war-threatening crisis right. in Ukraine now, and there one occurred only, uh, I think, six months ago. So, I mean, it, one can almost imagine that uh, uh, Mr. Xi would ask for this kind of pattern to continue, and this continues to um, create the, the perception in, in, in the Pentagon that they have to continue to be ready uh, for a Ukraine scenario, and then suddenly uh, that's not the scenario. So I think that's quite feasible. But I, I don't. As for like simultaneous war against both powers, no, I don't. I don't see that. We have just three minutes. There was a question in the back. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Um, what is the chance of a diplomatic solution, given that our foreign service is decimated in the last uh, administration? Do you think that could ever work? Is there any indication that they're going to try that? Because this seems like a perfect opportunity. Well, I, I would argue, of course, for an effort at diplomatic, a diplomatic solution. Um, but we've seen now a series of meetings between the United States and China, which begin with an American recitation of 
con condemning China for all sorts of real or imagined transgressions. Right. Uh, this is not how to produce a meeting of the minds. Uh, you do that by sitting down and saying, you know, I disagree about, a lot. I know we disagree about lots of things, but look at this situation. How do you evaluate that? Well, I actually see that the same way you do. Uh, I think if we don't take action, that's going to go bad and it's going to be bad for both of us. Do you think we might act if we can't work together? Could we act in parallel? Could we reach the same end by different roads? Anyway, that's how diplomatic dialogue is supposed to go. It isn't supposed to open with an artillery barrage. <laughs> I don't see it in this crowd now in Washington. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I could easily see it in the case of the people who manage diplomacy in China. Um, but I, don't get me into uh, characterizing the staffing patterns of the Biden administration or the lack thereof, or, or Ted Cruz holding every diplomatic position, or Marco Rubio uh, halting the nominee for ambassador to Beijing, because he thinks, just by virtue of his having been in the Foreign Service, he was a sellout to China for his whole career. That is a gross uh, slander of Nick Burns. Uh, so, Anyway, we have a dysfunctional government. I don't see it. I don't, I don't think being able to mount that kind of serious diplomacy. Lyle, a last word we have a minute. Oh, oh, well, thanks again, everyone, for coming out. But I, I would just underline that uh, I think the opportunities for diplomacy on this question are very, uh, are really ample. Uh, you know, let's not forget Ma Ying Zhou uh, met with Xi Jinping in Singapore and had a, had a, um, amiable discussion. Uh, that was only what, uh, that was 2015, December 2015, I think. So I, that wasn't that long ago. It, it wouldn't be that hard to get back to that. So I think, you know, it behooves us all to, um, you know, to uh, speak up and, and suggest that there are diplomatic ways out, you know, along the lines that Ambassador Freeman has been advocating. This issue is going to get solved if it ever is solved between Beijing and Taipei, not between Beijing and Washington. Mm -hmm. Um, and therefore, as I argued, we need to try to create conditions in which people in Taiwan see it as in their interest, indeed imperative, to open, reopen a dialogue with the mainland. What happens in that dialogue? What solution they come to, if any, is their business. But uh, this is Westphalian, I suppose. I think so. uh, but, <laughs> but it is... Um, not the case that the Chinese Civil War, which has largely been fought in Washington over the past 70 years, <laughs> uh, can be ended in Washington. Uh, so real question is, what do we have to do to change the calculus in Taipei about dialogue? Then they can make up their own mind about what the content of the dialogue is. Great, Chaz Freeman, Lao Golson, this has been a important conversation with obviously many more to come, but thank you so much and thank you all for your questions. <laughs>